Do you know how the Japanese aircraft industry was created? It was all about big industrial and financial conglomerates creating aircraft manufacturing branches, then adding design bureaus to them, finding suppliers and service partners, etc. It was all very orderly, with very little room for rogue agents, dreamers, or crazy ambitious schemes. But the Kawanishi Aircraft Company clearly didn't get the memo. Founded by a bunch of geeks, this manufacturer proved to be extremely flexible. The history of the company is full of twists and turns, with many events that were simply not supposed to happen in the brutal market governed by big industrial conglomerates. It all began simply because an engineer called Seibei Kawanishi got fed up with dealing with the strict corporate hierarchy of the Nakajima Zaibatsu. He was interested in conquering the skies and traversing the seas, not in pushing paper in the office. That's why this engineer left the conglomerate and created his own company, with a group of like-minded people and the goal to design seaplanes. In the hyper-militaristic Japan of the time, though, no one really cared for a bunch of engineers that wanted to make commercial seaplanes. And that's why for the longest time, Kawanishi was operating as more of a support act, building aircraft designed by other companies or taking care of all sorts of small orders. The breakthrough moment happened when Kawanishi won the contract to design a new three-seat, long-range reconnaissance float plane for the Navy with their E-7K prototype. This biplane allowed the company to finally spread its wings, figuratively speaking. It was such a successful design that it remained in service right until the end of World War II. The next aircraft that Kawanishi designed for the Navy was the H-6K flying boat, a large four-engined monoplane with the parasol wing, and it was as if the dream of conquering the skies and traversing the seas finally came true. Even though this vehicle was primarily built for military purposes, its very long range allowed Japan to haul passengers and freight to many distant islands in the Pacific. In fact, almost half of all H-6K flying boats were built without any armament at all. The aircraft were only modified to carry weapons after the start of the war. That wasn't enough, though. The dreamers of Kawanishi were hungry for more. After all, on the other side of the globe, the majestic and considerably more advanced short Sunderland, with its powerful engines and a wing without lift struts, had already made its debut. The Japanese had to keep up, and in 1940, Kawanishi introduced the H-8K, a maritime patrol flying boat that surpassed its British counterpart in basically all aspects. Well, except for the sheer scale of production and number of aircraft made. But before we go on with the video, let's talk about definitions for a bit. What's the difference between a float plane and a flying boat? Both are technically seaplanes, but they are, in fact, not the same. In Japan, for example, float planes and flying boats were specifically marked with different letters in their designations. A float plane is an aircraft equipped with pontoons, or, well, floats. In the Japanese Navy, this type of aircraft was designated with the letter N. And a flying boat is an aircraft with a hull that serves both as the plane's floating body and its fuselage. Those were designated with the letter H. We give you this information because almost immediately after the start of the war in the Pacific, the Navy realized that the Zero A6M2N, which was basically a naval aircraft equipped with floats as an afterthought, was not the best, to put it mildly. The addition of a huge float nullified the advantages of the original Zero and made its flaws even more prominent. The military obviously wanted to switch to a seaplane designed from scratch, but design bureaus across the country were already up to their ears in work. And that's why the project was given to Kawanishi. And oh boy was the Navy not ready for the things that were to come. At first, everything went according to plan. As early as the first half of 1942, the Navy received the N-1K-1, with N in the name clearly stating that the Kyofu was designed as a float plane. The thing was that the Navy didn't actually need that many float plane fighters. 
What they really needed was a lot of deck-based fighters and shore-based interceptors. It wasn't too hard to get a lot of the former, but getting the latter proved to be a huge problem. Factories making the land-based J2M Raiden really struggled to meet production demands. That's when the mad lads at Kawanishi came up with the genius idea to make a new interceptor out of the Kyofu. And not the type outlined in the specifications of the original contest, that Kawanishi wasn't even invited to take part in, by the way, but the aircraft that the Navy actually needed. When the first prototype of the Jinbu rolled off the factory floor, the people at the Navy couldn't even decide on the name. Should it be J3K? Maybe J6K? They even refused to test it. The whole concept of somebody building an interceptor for them without being asked to do that beforehand was just way too wild for the top brass. The military asked Kawanishi not to do things nobody asked for and concentrate on the tasks at hand, but it was too late. Engineers were too into it by that point. Completely on their own, they decided that the Jinpu was already too different from the Kyofu and that the 14-cylinder engine that they had to work with was way too underpowered. The end result of their work was the N1K1J, an incredible aircraft that could compete against the best late-war Allied fighters. The only thing holding it back was its main landing gear. The Shiden retained the mid-mounted wing of the float plane, necessitating a long, stocky, and fragile landing gear. It didn't seem like that was something that could be easily fixed, but Kawanishi engineers were undeterred. They simply moved the wings to a lower position, turning the Shiden into a low-wing aircraft, just like other land-based fighters. Once again, this kind of radical last-minute redesign was unheard of in military aviation. But once again, the blokes at Kawanishi didn't get the memo. The flabbergasted folks at the Imperial Japanese Navy didn't have much choice but to accept the updated version of the aircraft into service. And you know what they got? The finest aircraft of its class available to Japanese pilots at the time. And unsurprisingly, they loved it. Nevertheless, the Japanese Empire lost the war, and the Japanese aircraft industry was left in shambles. Many companies and manufacturers closed down, or left the industry to seek profits elsewhere. Kawanishi was in the latter camp. The first few years after the war, they made a very good use of their expertise of basically doing anything that life sent their way. After all, they were also known for designing industrial scales and cement mixers. But it wasn't long until the world needed their expertise once again. First, the company started taking care of American flying boats during the Korean War, maintaining and repairing equipment, and then they were finally designing new aircraft once again, this time for the JSDF. What are your favorite Kawanishi planes, by the way? Tell us in the comments below.